Hello everyone and welcome back to the EGF. This unfortunately is our final match of the night. We've had some scheduling conflicts, but we're still working out some of those. But for now, we've got the Niagara Purple Eagles going up against the Canisius College Golden Griffins, my alma mater, in their rival match. These two schools, not too far away from each other, they call it the Battle of the Bridge. And uh, these are two schools in the MAC conference looking to kind of claw their way back in the conference. Ooh, honestly, at least for when it comes down to this team, it is going to be interesting, especially when Niagara are already down by six, so that's not really going to be uh, looking too great on the scoreboard just due to a player forfeit. So, you know, uh, at least the storyline here is can Niagara kind of bring it back uh, against a team who are leading without even having to fight? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, a player for Niagara could not make it, so uh, Canisius, they get those six points on the board already, and uh, that's a good start for Canisius, but uh, Niagara, this is a team that really struggled last season, or at least last split, and I'm curious to see what they can bring to the table this split, or, uh, or at least for this spring split. We should mention that this roster, I believe it's entirely freshman. They had a lot. I'm, I'm talking all five of their original starters gone from graduation from last season. So they were literally starting from scratch and it did not bode well for them through the middle, <laughs> through the early to middle portions of the season. But as the season started to go on, they really started to find a little bit more of their footing. They were making a lot of their matches a little bit closer and uh, I'm curious to see if they've put in the time and work here to really give themselves a shot here in the second half of the season. You know, personally, me, I'm always really excited to see freshmen come in and play. I mean, you know, sometimes when you go to college, that's not something you're expecting to spend some of your free time with, especially in high school, where they say that college is not going to accept things like that. But then they do. So uh, I'm definitely excited to see this pretty much untapped potential this well of knowledge that these players will be shining in so you know though we can compare them to their last i definitely feel that'd be a dishonest service especially since uh, they're already working with I, I would say a pretty different style compared to their you know predecessors especially the way they want to go against each other yeah and on the flip side of that canisius uh, they are currently three and five overall in their record mm -hmm. right now, uh, trying to find their way back into the top of the MAC conference. They've had a lot of players over the past two years, a lot of talent graduate over the years. And this new roster they've got this season, it's got, you know, kind of a wide variety of, of both play styles and uh, in terms of characters. I mean, most notably, you've got the Captain Flapjack on this Crom, who's been very good. But this is a player I want to talk about, MKL Rising. He was kind of kind of one of the rising stars of this Canisius team last season <laughs> on the Ness. And he was gone all of last split, spent a semester abroad, so he could not play. Now he's back, now he's here, and going up against Boshiki. Ready to put up the shine against the Purple Man, the Bite of 87, as they say. I'm personally a Donkey Kong fan, but there is one glaring issue that comes for the monkey, and that's just how annoying he can be going up against a character like Ness, which not only has a bit more range than you, but a lot more control over the game. You, you really just gotta be playing that over-aggressive playstyle and, you know, pray that your ally, I mean, your opponent, puts you back on the stage. That PK Thunder can be both a blessing and a threat. Yoshi Koopa, one of the players for this Niagara roster that they really looked at and said there, there's untapped potential here, but he will lose his first stock and able to check the stage and make it back all the way. So MKL rising off to a hot start here with the, with the uh, first stock off the board. I mean, it's just really hard for DK to get too much value. I mean, Ness is a very easy character to hit, but I mean, it's it's so small delays. As you saw, the side me trying to stun Ness just does not work. Miko's going to be able to get away 
with a lot here, and it's just more of trying to predict. I mean, that's just a good moment of punishment, though. You know, you already know the Ness is not going to live. Just making confirming the kill is a shining point. And that's something we didn't see a lot of uh, last year. Boshi Cooper was often, you know, struggling to find grabs there, just taking what, you know, uh, MKL gives to him, and MKL able to respond very quickly with that up air. Already just looking to kind of play a, a, a relatively proactive Donkey Kong has not been working too well, but you don't have any other excuse. You can't even change your own place out. You just have to keep trying to do your best breaking through these PK fires. And well, honestly, it's been incredibly difficult, but those are moments where you can punish your opponent. Good drag down on the forward air to get that grab. Wanted to bait him into the rocket, but was not going to happen. And Oshi Koopa has to play very carefully here. He's at 80%, which isn't quite kill percentage. Oh, wait. oh no! Oh no. That is tragic. That is a feels bad moment. And the air dodge off stage and DK's recovery, it is not very vertical at all. And uh, yeah, the second that air dodge happens, you know that it's a bad sign. And MKL rising though, We'll take game one by a two-stock victory. You know, the name may be Bite of 87. That was the fall of 87. That just, uh, that's not going to be a confidence booster, I dare say. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, that's not going to be something that we have to worry about too much. Maybe just a small little input issue. Maybe <laughs> Bushi's on Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's something that works when, uh, it's something that happens commonly, I think, when you play Donkey Kong. Uh, I still, though, do want to point out how well Miko is playing this Ness. It's a different playstyle than I think we've used to. We, we've seen, like, two, maybe three different Nesses all night, and I don't think one has been uh, this, uh, you know, proactive when it comes down to using that PK Thunder or, or using that PK Fire more often. They are just looking to zone you out, get you off the stage, and then they're using those resources. Rather, well, we're seeing Bushi make sure to use the PK uh, Fire to stop Donkey Kong from even you know, getting a hit on them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, this is something, too, that Nicole Rising has done a very good job of, of knowing the direction that up B will send you, any of those specific hitboxes, be it the tail or the actual ball, being able to follow up off of it, that's something he's done a very good job of uh, throughout his time here at the EGF. Running it back to PS2 for game number two. And I don't mind this uh, at all because, I mean, there were times where this match was very close. But Boshi Koopa, just a few mistakes here or there. Obviously, that, that SD. But, you know, this is a, a, a matchup that feels doable for Boshi Koopa. Honestly, I agree. I think it's one of those, it, it's not a full counter out, and while Donkey Kong can, isn't really considered a top tier character, I do believe in like in the competitive scene, he is rated relatively extremely low. You know, this is where a player's own style can abuse, especially when you're not used to going up against a, I mean, like this is one of the moments where Bushi wants to be playing forward, but still has to be extremely cautious going up against a character who just literally punch you in the face. Good back air and the dash up grab there and the turnaround of that downbeat, but he should be able to make it back. Good quick reaction there from the goal rising to get back to that stage. That that downbeat spike, we rarely ever see it, but he is able to use it there and kind of put MKL on the defensive for only a moment though, because MKL rising controlling the stage once again. Definitely see why Bushi wants to hide or not really hide but play on this edge you, you definitely force the the room of what to do when you're being the aggressor miko can kind of react to that but when miko has to be the aggressor uh you can pretty much adapt to whatever's happening but i don't think you can adapt to that that's just an unfortunate moment another air dodge off stage causing Boshi Koopa to fall a little bit too far. MKL rising, good spacing on that up B. Really, no way for Boshi Koopa to clean the edge guard. Follow-ups here on the combos now from MKL rising, trying to possibly bait him with that up B. No grab there from Boshi Koopa either. And MKL, he's up three to one, but he's gonna get spiked by the down B there. Boshi Koopa getting a stock on the board. 
Finally getting that stock is a good moment, but it's already too late as Bushi did not have the resources nor the ability, I think, uh, to, to go up against the nest. Maybe just a bad matchup or just being on that Wi-Fi falling out, not able to survive. We're going to be seeing once a uh, kind of Miko showing off a different style of nest, but one that I definitely enjoyed. Very stylish on that last kill. Yeah, and that side B, I feel like in this matchup in particular does so much work because DK is just such a big body that the hitbox, it, it can be a, a little uh, forgiving at times. And on a big character, it's very unforgiving as numerous times you saw MKL Rising use it to its full advantage, get a lot of percent on the board and right there using it to, to follow up on the spike. Uh, you, you make a great point. You know, I think that's kind of the reason why Donkey Kong is considered a very low character. It's just on the, those limited options. He's not as fast as, say, someone like Little Mac, Roy, or, or similar other melee characters. And he's not as uh, durable slash strong compared to someone like Bowser, Ganondorf, uh, King K. Rool. Uh, though he is a monkey, and that is very funny, it just does not work out in, in the competitive environment sometimes. I will say, though, good momentum kind of swing here off of that down B from Boshi Koopa. And again, this is something that we didn't see a lot of from Niagara in the first half of the split, right? They didn't find a lot of those openings, but you see, you know, those flashes of brilliance from Niagara. They're starting to learn, you know, what they need to do in order to, to you know, battle back in this league. Unfortunately, not enough time and MKL Rising taking full advantage of it. So with that... Niagara now find themselves down in a hole 12 to nothing here. And Canisius, I mean, they will be selecting their next character soon, but it is interesting to, to kind of see how Niagara has progressed. Because remember, they started off basically from scratch. And Boshi Koopa, he's been kind of the master of these heavies, right? I, I believe we saw Bowser mm -hmm. early on in the year. This DK, however, we saw... We saw this DK, I think, week one. I mean, he was not able to find a single grab. To find those numerous grabs in that set, it goes to show the work that he's put in. Yeah, I, I think while grab is a very easy thing to hit, when, when you're playing against somebody who's going for that one and is in that competitive mindset, it is very hard to consistently land it. So just to see, especially the grab throw off the stage, that was funny to me. And, you know, that's definitely something I'll be uh, cl <laughs> clipping and uh, sharing it to people. But regardless, uh, kind of continuing in the set, I think the, the rest of their team definitely need to show up a little, you know? Uh, not rather just because of that loss, but just because you, you're already at a bad mindset going down due to not only a forfeit, but then, uh, you know, the Donkey Kong mess up. It's where you kind of want to put more faith in your team. Like, we've got this. It doesn't matter. Boom. Walk in and you're already looking to three-stock your opponents. Yeah, we we'll, we'll, we will have to see. The next players have been locked in. It is a fly for Canisius. He is a uh, Game & Watch extraordinaire here uh, for the Golden Griffins, one of the few Game & Watches we have in this league. We've also seen uh, Minecraft Steve from him as well. Uh, we've seen that on occasion. Curious to see if he'll bring that out this set. Crispy uh, being locked in for the side of Niagara. Crispy's one of these players that uh, has kind of... Uh, He's kind of a jack of all trades. We've seen him switch uh, kind of numerous weeks between characters. If one matchup doesn't go well, he'll opt for another. You know, if this matchup doesn't go well, maybe he picks a fifth character. He's got four characters so far that he's played this season. Incineroar was way back in the early portions of the week. Perry through the middle portion of the season. Krom we also saw for a little bit. And then Sora, when Sora came out as well, Crispy also played a little bit of that so it's i'm curious to see you know which of those characters uh gets locked in here or if there's a fifth one where that crispy can kind of find and uh or find a home on i guess honestly i i, I think i pretty much uh share that sentiment uh pretty closely i don't really think uh, it's too much though i feel uh Going up in, in these matchup, uh, the more I'm watching and the more I'm kind of noticing is just, I think more of it is, while characters can go up in closely, I think what's making these differences is often 
who's being a lot more cautious, who's taking a lot more time. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about, oh, you need to go aggressive, you need to be a lot more greedier, uh, but th the fine understanding and line between throwing greedy and, and good greedy has, uh, I, I think, been very obvious, especially in our past matches where some of these teams uh, play very fast, but they are still taking their second they're still shielding and they are making sure to shut down any opponent that they see and it just as an example from the map that we just saw you know the donkey kong has every moment to just walk into you and that ness ness can just spam and they were making sure to space back go aggressive by throwing in a utility uh, such as pk thunder pk fire and then making sure to follow up on it which is something that uh i, I think shines as a player who is making sure that they're using everything to the best of their ability yeah no absolutely and uh and also i talked about how uh mccall rising was one of these plays we didn't see last split he actually spent a semester abroad so he he hasn't necessarily been in the competitive scene for well seemingly at least a semester so for him to jump right back into it from the get-go is is really impressive and also for the side of Canisius you know we I, I mentioned earlier how a lot of uh this uh this roster or this this program's talent had graduated but the rising talent on this roster has really been impressive players like a fly in particular this game and watch steve we've even seen dr mario in his kit he's been mm -hmm. very good uh for canisius three and four this season and uh you also look even you know down the roster you go uh, Deku Sky, Sephiroth, Zelda. He's had moments in way back in season one when he was getting three stocks. Season two, he was getting three stocks in the uh, few appearances that he made. You know, it, it's it's interesting to see, you know, how the younger talent in these schools uh, is really starting to, to find their way. Uh, I definitely agree on that idea, and honestly, I really like Dr. Mario. It is one of those more meme kind of clone characters that ended up turning into a semi-top tier, but Sora has been a character that has been shining through the series, and I mean, uh, that's a given. From Disney's gotta be the number one character, but the versatility, the combat, just the, the recovery, there's honestly very little weak points when it comes down to Sora. Yeah, and uh, for Dr. Mario, I think A-Fly is the only Dr. Mario we've seen so far at the EGF. So, interesting to see what he brings to the table here. And I feel like Dr. Mario is one of those characters that, you know, it, it initially, as Crispy, uh, the upbeat, not quite reaching the ledge there, you, you don't know, uh, you know, you don't look at Dr. Mario as initially one of these characters that seems super threatening, but then you get hit by Dr. Mario. And every hit Dr. Mario lands, it just feels like you're getting hit by a truck. Oh, that is definitely a point. So I, I, I'd say a little bit more different compared to the Mario, at least when he goes down uh, to the pill popping. Uh, but Crispy still has relative good control. That side B, being able to track you and have still positive frames is not something that you'll see often. I think it's going to be harder for a, a fly to kind of narrow this gap in. It's up to Crispy to move in, get punished, and then that's what a fly benefits off of. Crispy right now trying to find a way to respond has a fly off stage but can't connect with those spells quite yet has the fire on that neutral beat but the dash attack not going to be able to take the stock quite yet Good weave around those projectiles by a fly and the quick turnaround jab hill not going to land down air not going to land either and the up beat beating that side b and both of them kind of playing with fire around this ledge and crispy able to knock a fly off stage once again Look at that reflect! I mean, a fly would have fallen off the stage and died, but uses the reflect, able to get back on. That's micro abilities that you're not often seeing. But I mean, Crispy still can't use everything just to go after this Dr. Mario. I mean, the side beat, if it messes and you're off the stage, you get knocked off. And Dr. Mario literally sends you to the hospital. And so you've got to be extremely careful. 179% on this Dr. Mario right now. Wanted the forward air, could not quite find it. That side beam nearly killed last time, but Crispy unable to land the third portion of it. And A-Fly just trying to play the mind game and gets outspaced by the forward smash. Crispy taking the first stop. 
That was like a baseball moment. That was a hey, better, better swing. Uh, though Crispy's not really in the room for that. Almost goes out. A fly. Still taking no damage. I mean, this is just what shows up. What Dr. Mario is better at not only having a good reflect, but consistent damage. The combos, the air hits. There's really not much the Sora can do if they're not controlling the spacing. Oh my goodness! What is Sora to do? Can't snap the ledge and the dock with the boots gives him the down air. And that is going to be a two stock victory for a fly in game number one. So Kanishas, they extend that lead to 14. And if a fly wins this set, they would win the match overall. But again, we will play out all our sets. If that were the case, crispy, you saw some moments where Maybe he could get something going, but A-Fly felt like he felt at least like he was in control of this set from the start. I mean, so I really want to give you some like good analytical feedback uh, and everything. However, <laughs> I think uh, I got to put on new underwear. Uh, I don't, that was, <laughs> that was just dirty. Hey, I don't know, something about the Mario action, like foot stomp. It, it just, it just got me. That was, that was incredibly shining, but you know, definitely bring, I a hundred percent, um, feel, uh, with you on, on kind of that sentiment, but I feel crispy is not really using Sora to, to the finest of Sora is really floaty and, and Mario has to go for a lot of risk trying to hit it as well as, uh, the fire utility, because if I tried to pronounce it, I would definitely make people mad. That's a, that's a <laughs> promise on, on your front, but you're going to be able to spam that consistently. Thunder, uh, it takes a second and you can be punished for it. But Ice, Ice is my favorite because it is the best zoning tool. You may not be able to hit much damage with it, but your opponent, if they're over the edge and they are at enough health, they can't even recover. And Mario, Dr. Mario has one of those better recoveries compared to the Mario brothers, Luigi and Mario, and Wario, I guess if you want to count them. Uh, but... There is still a weakness that goes to it, and I definitely feel that's where you got to be utilizing that single ability. We saw a lot of the side B, but a little thing is that there is a delay. You're, you're still a tiny bit positive as long as you're touching the ground, but if you were to do it over the edge, there's no recovery. You can't up B. You just fall down the edge like a little fly. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. But uh, here, the the other thing too is that Crispy never really got the chance to almost go for for something like that, right? It felt like A Fly, you know, he had a plan for every initial combo that he was able to land. Like he he was able to land the combo starter starter and then go from there, right? Kind of improv improvise from there. Whereas Crispy, if he got a dash attack, there was no real follow up on it, right? Especially, mm -hmm. and think back, think back to the first stock that Afly had, right? He got up to what 170 or so, I want to say. Yeah. By the time he died, and even for a character like Sora, that feels wrong. It feels like you, with this character, you should be able to take a stock a little bit earlier. You have to be a little bit more careful about it, but 170 is just a lot for any character. Yeah, however, I feel this stage, this is an equal one, not one where it really changes the format. At most, Sora's own down smash is just going to be less effective. But I mean, look at that. A fly is looking to style when it comes to the Sora. Even got the parry timing right. I've got to say, you know, uh, I don't want to get my medication from this type of doctor, but I definitely want to see them as a patient. Good land there by a fly. Can't quite find the punish onto Crispy as he makes it back to stage. And those side Bs, they do start to chunk out some damage, but a fly still in control of stage from here is able to get back to ledge those Crispy. He's got a fly above him, but can't quite find a, a way to hit him and. Here's another grab for a fly. The back throw that will do it. That's first stock off the board. I mean, a fly is doing the right thing by continuously throwing out the pills. I mean, Sora needs that second or two just to be able to hit you, and you know it causes that delay. It makes that frustration and while you're going for these big risky plays, you're not really getting punished for them, especially going for these down smashes. It, it's almost interesting because a fly, it, it gets away with practical murder and, and Crispy's not getting the chance to use Sora to the greatest ability. 
another grab and crispy a lot of kind of empty jumps back onto stage not a lot of uh moves thrown out to kind of protect himself either and that up B, that actually does manage to seal away the second stock so crispy on his last stock now a fly he's getting back up to these high percentages oh, oh no the side you. B took him off stage I told, didn't I warn you, Soy? Didn't I warn him? Oh, all it that's... took was the block. That's all it took for the punishment, Soy. I warned him. I told him several times. That's the big problem when it comes down to Sora. And now it's clipped for all to see, and that's not going to be working good. You've just given the three stock to a fly, and I mean, a fly didn't even move the controller. I think that's just a moment of like realization of what just happened. He nearly catches A fly on the get up from uh, ledge with that first one, but then the the momentum, right, the second bit just takes him too far and they're, they're, to the point of no return. So, A fly, you get the three stock, and that secures the victory for the Golden Griffins. But we've still got two more sets to play. See if Niagara can get anything on the board here and stop the bleeding. Is A fly. That's one of his more solid showings this year. I, I definitely would agree. And even if A Fly won that match, at what cost? At what cost to your <laughs> opponent's own suicide? What do you gain from it? What experience? I guess just a really nice uppercut and uh, a, a scoreboard on <laughs> on your own tally, which hey, I, I'm totally chill with. Uh, I definitely think uh, you know, not the first time that we've seen Sora, but. One of those times where uh, we, we can kind of see one of the weaknesses of Sora and one of the shining moments of Dr. Mario, which is not always considered uh, a really strong character, but, you know, still better than the original version. Right, and we were talking about, uh, too, how, you know, Crispy had all these these characters that he was picking from time to time, and it feels like, you know, maybe now that Sora has come out for him that he can you know, put a little bit more time into one character because it, it seems like he's starting to really like that Sora pick. And on the flip side of that, it feels like A-Fly, a he's got the Game & Watch on lock. We've, we've seen that Game & Watch work. And we've seen Steve on, on a rare occasion. But now with a Dr. Mario in his pocket, it's just it just adds that extra little wrinkle, right? It's almost like the, yeah. the extra bonus problem on the homework assignment for every other team. They got to be like, okay, we've got a fly in this roster. He's got this game and watch. That's his tried and true. But if he goes doc now, what do we do, right? Now, it just it's that extra little wrinkle that teams are going to have to worry about. And so for for a fly to have such a strong showing on this Dr. Mario certainly adds to the worry for everyone else. Yeah, and I, I think especially like when uh, comparably Game & Watch is a stronger character, it is definitely considered more top tier by the vast community, though uh, once again, everything I say is always up to debate because it's <laughs> just like the, you know, watching the scene, seeing what people play and all that. But still, I, that's the versatility that we talked uh, earlier with a different team uh, that brings you to the supreme territory that makes you a very dangerous opponent to go up against. And a fly is definitely getting closer and closer to that realm though not there yet you still got a lot to show but hey that's what's important so we will be getting into set number three between these two and uh with that it looks like i believe it is flapjack being uh locked in for the side of canisius flapjack the captain of this canisius roster he is exclusively gone actually uh, I, I take that back. He has 99% of the time gone Krom. There was one match where he went Kirby instead, but it did yeah. not go so well for his, for his uh, for for that one solo performance. On the other hand, his Krom looks really good. Numerous games way back last season, he was going up against a lot of teams, anchors, getting a lot of points, and even this season, he's been tasked with a lot if he is not winning his match he is certainly mitigating the amount of points that a lot of these uh higher ups typically gain so he is uh fun to watch to say the least on the other side niagara i believe it's crisis or red saw going in 
And both of these characters, I believe they both played Bowser for a time. Actually, Crisis was Ganondorf, Zelda, and Wolf. So another player with a kind of a, a full cast uh, in <laughs> under their belt to to really pick from. Whereas yeah. uh, Red saw, we saw both Bowser and Sora in their lineup as well. So we'll have to see what they do uh, moving forward. Uh, I think at least for me, when it comes down to uh, looking at the, the play styles and, and, you know, the possible two players, Red Saw versus Crisis. Crisis runs, uh, I think, a character for a specific reason. Ganondorf, Zelda, and Wolf are not similar at all. You, you, they have such different styles that, uh, you know, you put that in when you're ready to adapt or when you're looking to be a little more mean. However, I feel Red Saw not only with that Bowser, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bowser and Sora, <laughs> those are two different characters, but uh, it's almost in a similar sense of how different they are. I definitely feel that Red Saw uh, is the bit more stronger one. Uh, that's mostly because I've gotten a chance to take a look. I've seen the Sora in action, and the Sora is good. Uh, being able to use that thunder to stop your enemies from getting onto the stage, freezing them, it it's a shining moment for a lot of these players and... Well, sometimes that's just not what Ganondorf, Zelda, or Wolf are able to do. I, I feel they're really good at kind of putting in the damage, but it really is up to this Bowser versus the Krom that the fight will be focused on. And Red Saw is the player for this Niagara team, and Red Saw is one of the few players on this team to have actually, you know, gotten uh, some decent points on the board for Niagara this season, although he did show up a little bit later in the season. I think week three or four was his first appearance. So the times that we've seen him, he has been good. But again, so has Flapjack on the flip side of that. Flapjack is often going up against some of the team's best players. And he's showing why right now. That's a clean back air to clean up that first stock. I agree. I mean, you yeah, know, there, there used to be the meme of Chromicide, and yet players still find ways to adapt, ways to get back onto the stage, and that's what I call adapting and improvement. Though Bowser has a lot of armor and is able to kind of take these hits, it's still a big problem when you're not able to land any hits. Flapjack is still pumping it in. Another jab to back air, and that's something we see, interestingly, uh, kind of a new form of playstyle from Flapjack, is, are those those little side Bs that he does in the air to kind of almost, was it, wave bounce? To kind of reposition himself, uh, excuse me, reposition himself and change the angle that he's approaching from. He's, uh, that's something he did not used to do, and it's a new aspect to his game that has really kind of thrown off a lot of players. Honestly, it's always interesting. I, I feel that every season, every semester, when it comes down to the EGFC, no team is ever the same. And I mean, just look how it's going. 90 to 1 to 75. Bowser's able to survive most things. Falling in lava, uh, being burnt to a crisp, being taken over. But a counter? I think that's where we draw the line. Smart counter there by Flapjack to take that stock, but the Flame Breath actually pushing him too far away from the stage to recover. So Flapjack losing his first stock and Red Saw on the board. Uh, it, I think it's more more difficult for Red Saw to kind of break through than it is for Flapjack. I mean, not only is there speed, but the range advantage Red Saw uh, the reliance is more on just hitting Crom, but that's not really going to work to your favor when you're being launched like a volleyball. And you get smashed, hit under the stage, and then off. Oh, that's just dirty. I mean, I'm in shock. I, I mean, how did how did Flapjack know? I mean, yes, Bowser's recovery is a little bit easier to predict. How did he know he was going to be right there and jump into that exact spot? Flapjack yeah. reading him and sealing away game one. Because, like, I mean, as we look, that's a mid-air flip. That could have been a punish if, if, if Flapjack had messed that up. But that is, I mean, you were in style point for even being able to, to land it. You know, you put the casters in a moment where, you know, just like in Dr. Mario, we, we don't really know what to say. 
And I gotta point out, maybe that's just what Flash, uh, Flapjack wants to tell us uh, with this match. They are here, they are new and improved, and they're ready to put on a performance while winning. I will say also, Flapjack, uh, from, from what we've seen, one of the other aspects of his game that he's done a very good job of his offstage gameplay is, has improved a lot as well. I, and, and that's something that I feel like you have to do as Krom, right? He doesn't have a lot of options uh, because of his kind of limited recovery. And even here, you know, just gets beat out by the by the flame breath. But he, he's something that, you know, things like that, that drop down, excuse me, drop down from ledge back air. And even that neutral B, right? Just not afraid to go off stage and say, hey, you think you're safe because I'm a sortie, but no, I do have the ability to go off stage and challenge you. It's another kind of wrinkle to the game plan. Honestly, I think you put it best. And, you know, when you got to look at the, the gameplay, I wonder, do you stick with that Bowser? Personally, on my side, uh, I think that was an amazing example of why you sometimes shouldn't go Bowser. Uh, it, it just weren't really able to consistently land a hit, use any of your abilities, though the fire was really good at forcing a Chrome off the edge and its own little suicide. We weren't able to do that very often. Or at all. Which hurts, so I definitely feel we know that Red Soul plays Sora. And Sora, I think, can mitigate what Chrome does very well. Has the same utensils, but also has ways to slow down that speed. And uh, I think those are the moments that we truly can see shine from Redsaw. Yeah, uh, we'll have to see if he opts for that character swap or not. Uh, the the Sora we saw, of course, you know, later on in the season once Sora was released because they worked out at the at the start of that season. And Redsaw is one of these players too that. Uh, you know, he does have a better time kind of adapting, I think, as a set goes on. He starts to catch on to a bit more of players' tendencies. So the longer a set goes, it feels like the better chance he has. In this case, I think just the speed of Flapjack kind of caught him off yeah. guard, right? And and plus, a sword versus Bowser, Bowser tends to struggle in that type of matchup. I mean, yeah, but... Hey, if the player still feels that Bowser is an optimal pick, I'm gonna respect it. Though, it is only going to get harder as you're on Final Destination. You don't have any platforms to defend yourself now, and I mean, Flapjack is already on a roll. Got Red Saw to the corner here right off the bat, but that down air will connect. And Flapjack caught the miss tech, but he wanted the forward smash and could not find it in time. Wanted to, to use that side B, and that's, again, another portion of his game, utilizing it to kind of mix up the angle that he is approaching from, kind of throwing off Red Saw's movement once again. And that back air going to connect and run off forward air, not taking the stock quite yet. The back air will seal it, though. Hey, definitely a big point. We're just looking at these teams. Well, not teams, rather these players. We're trying to get a sense of what to exactly do, and I think that's more preferred onto Red Saw. You know, that's one of the moments where you almost get punished. If Red Saw had just had a second to react, you could have thrown out the fire, stopped them from pushing in. But look, that's the exact reason. Wait, what? Oh no. I, I think I know exactly what happened, and that is tragic. Red Saw's, I... Red Saw's neutral being to try and knock Flapjack away like he did last time. But the sword clipped him, and because he's holding out on the fire, he's DIing out when the sword hits him, so it pulls him off stage, and Flapjack gets the stock for it. You know, we, 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 thankfully, we have replays because that's something we definitely need to clip for Red Saw to even understand. Though at 171, it is really hard. Red Saw is not really able to consistently get Flapjack off the stage to be able to use that fire, though that slash is what you're looking for at its high percentage and uh, such very bad luck. Uh, it's very much putting yourself on the back foot. And well, with, with Smash being a mental game at times, I don't know how well that's going to be helping. Wanted to catch a miss tech there and could not find it. Red saw at 102%, looking for any kind of momentum here in game number two against Flapjack. Connects that move into the forward air. 
Low recovery there from Flapjack. Smartly is able to make it back to stage. Good down tilt, catches a mistech, reads the no. roll in as well, and Flapjack gets the stock, takes roll. game two, and keeps Kanishis' momentum on a roll. Flapjack, you spiked already, all right? You, you, you somehow, you know, I've got to look at it in, in 3D, just like, look at this moment. I don't remember if this is it, but you, you manage to force the opponent to fall off the edge and you grab onto the side, freely escaping. And now you do this, you're predicting your opponent. Look at that massive brain. Bowser's even confused on what's going on. <laughs> I've got to say, beautiful. Very well done. And uh, I, that, that time and experience against a lot of these top players in the EGF, going up against the the proverbial number ones from each team it feels like has definitely paid off here's that upbeat right the fire catches him and the second one it just pulls him off oh. stage that's that's incredibly unlucky if you're red saw too that the second fire did not or that the fire here on Wait. the second upbeat did not catch him you know what's even worse? It's, it's solely from the fact that Red Saw is using fl the flamethrower gets hit. They're probably still pressing down or like left from using it, which makes it go faster. So not even a time to react. That's just so unfortunate. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's that's just rough. There's no other way to say it because it, uh, like you said, it, it worked in game number one, right? If it ain't broke, don't yeah. fix it. And all of a sudden, Flapjack finds a way around it. And that's and that goes to kind of what I was saying before, is that Flapjack's offstage gameplay, sometimes he just finds those moments where he's able to make it back to stage. You think, okay, Krom's offstage. This is the part where he's in trouble. And he finds a way to get back to the ledge. He, he takes advantage of the tiniest of details to, to give himself a second shot at life. And that's huge in a format like this, right? If you're able to keep your stock in any way, shape or form, that point differential could be massive. You look at Canisius right now, trying to find their way back into, into kind of the middle of the, the pack of, of the EGF, their point differentials at minus 46, it's 16th in the league. If they have a big win like they do here against Niagara, all of a sudden, they're back to even, and they're right back in the in the thick of things. That's something to definitely look out for. Even though we've seen these players play before, I think it's more impressive that they are still able to surprise us to this factor. Uh, and especially going on to the series, you know, I, this is what you need. This is what you're looking out for. I... I'm at a loss for words, but at least knowing that we're getting closer to the end, maybe these players are settling down. Their adrenaline is now calming, and they're not looking for things that are going to give me nightmares. All right. Well, we are about we're we're getting ready for the final set between these two teams. It looks like the players are locked in. Crisis from Niagara, uh, who I wasn't sure about at first. He is that fourth and final player for the Purple Eagles. We'll see which character they opt for. And on the other side, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it is Weebson, who is a dark pit main for Canisius and Weebson's one of these players that's been putting a lot of work in and you can see some of the results that he's been able to come up with. He unfortunately this season it's been a little bit of a rough ride for him. Constantly getting time to play, but he is also getting counterpicked a lot. 1 and 6 so far. But you see these flashes of brilliance. All, a lot of those losses, they are, you know, only 4 points against, maybe 5. You know, few and far between the sevens and eights. It is a he's a player that has put in a lot of work, and I'm excited to see what he can bring to the table here. Uh, honestly, I am ex extremely excited, though. I would say I'm not excited for Weebson. Uh, Dark Pit as a character <laughs> uh, is one of my favorites. It has I've been playing Pit since you know the last game since uh, ever since I could. But the problem that comes with Dark Pit is it's not very good, though. Uh, your your supercharge ability, your side beat, you get armor on it. You're going up against somebody who has the versatility and the ability to kind of counteract. And, well, Samus is one of those, well, Zero Suit Samus uh, is one of those characters who is more than prepared to kind of play against it. I think this is where you just have to outspeed the character. 
Add another character to the list here for Crisis. This is the first appearance of ZSS for uh, this Niagara roster. And on Final Destination, Crisis had a little bit of an early deficit. Good early air dodge there from Crisis to get around Weebson's up smash. And Weebson doing a good job in neutral Ooh. right now. But that down be sneaky and actually grounding Weebson. I think some people forget that Zero Two Samus can do it. It's similar to Shulk, but it's honestly just a lot better. And yeah, I definitely agree. Just look at that. Able to hit with the Supercharger. Use it to get back. Use their jump. Able to get back onto the map. And well, kind of bring more into the stage. But this is where Weebson needs to be a bit more careful. Needs to look to confirm these kills a lot faster. Just like that. You reset the timer. And now Crisis has to start adapting to you. And you're putting them in a very uncomfortable space. Love the use of Weebson's arrows, too. Makes very good use of that neutral B. And you think maybe, you know, with Dark Pit, the arrows don't really go all that far, right? With with Pit, you get a little bit more curve to it. And yet still, Weebson able to make good use of it. Great job of catching the flip jump there as well. So good job by, uh, by Weebson to read. And getting a few of these drag downs as well. Crisis able to get out of the corner for only a moment. That up, not going to connect. That's going to be a forward smash, and that's going to be the second stock off the board. I mean, Weebson is just, per I think, perfectly playing Dark Pit, where the entire point of it is because you do that extra damage as well as your charger, you get armor on it. Wow, while Pit has a lot more range and is able to kind of hit these quicker shots, you're able to be a lot more dirty. Like you can't see it, but my jaw dropped. I, I I leaned back in my chair. My arms are up. I'm in what? shock. We we rarely see the runoff down air, and Weebson just said, "Yeah, this is it." <laughs> I mean, here's the thing: we have had like back-to-back -back maps where in the first set they do this stuff, and I don't know. Maybe this is their sign of showing how much they've improved. But that is just rude. I mean, look at that. Zero Two Samus is getting hit almost as if it was on the back but it's in the face. You just got punched in the face. And uh, I'm not sure. I have to look at that moment again to see if, if Crisis had any options left, right? I don't think they had the flip kick. I don't think they had their jump. Or if they did, they just were holding it too long and Weebson just did not give them the time to react. Love this snipe as well. Like we, I commented earlier, the use of these arrows from Weebson, usually using them in neutral, but now kind of using them as an edge guard tool, showing a lot of growth as a, as a player here. Absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think I'm more focused on uh, Crisis because, you know, I, I think Zero Two Samus versus the Dark Pit, that's not, a, you know, a composition to where a the Samus is not necessarily going to be on the the loose end i think you're just because you're a big agile character you have a lot of uh utility to just kind of play around the dark pit that you're, you're basically moving circles around and yet i was caught off guard i guess you really just can't rely on what a what a tier list tells you it's really just player comfortability and how well they are ready to show up yeah, absolutely. And uh, it also goes to a point we were talking about before. Weebson has exclusively gone Dark Pit. There's no pocket picks with Weebson. So what you see is what you get uh, out of his, you know, character cast. Whereas for Niagara, you see, you know, a couple of different, you know, characters per person, right? Even Boshi Koopa, it's DK mostly, but we also saw Bowser, you know, once or twice. Crispy's got his cast of characters. Uh, we saw Red saw, you know, he's got the Bowser and the Sora. And I think it goes to show, you know, when you put the time into these characters, you can see, you know, how that, that comes to fruition in these types of moments. You know, I definitely feel it seems that the Zero Two Samus is coming back in, but Weebson is putting on more aggression than we saw last round. And I mean... Just look as we've seen as prioritizing not letting Crisis on this stage. Almost as if they fear what capabilities that Crisis has. Crisis already at 93% and Weebson taking a little bit of chip damage. That was a good reflect, but the up smash does not connect. So Crisis, second chance at life here. Doesn't find the down smash, but he has Weebson in the corner. Those nares from Weebson too, doing a lot of work in a timely kind of manner. 
but this could be a follow-up. The upbeat doesn't connect. Crisis dashing through his opponent, unable to find the hit he needs. And now both players at kill percent, that forward throw not going to do it. The snipe not going to happen this time around. Ooh, and a nice clip through the ground with the upbeat. Give us more space. Weebson is having troubles, at least, uh, confirming these kills uh, unlike before. And I think that's given to the little platform. Samus is going to work better off of it because uh, Dark Pit really wants to play this, like, land ground. Really wants to be going for these smashes, which Samus is not really be going for. And another beautiful snipe to just confirm that kill, taking the lead in this series. But Crisis still very close behind. And these snipes, too, are really important because ZSS is a character that, that feels like they should be very difficult to track down, but Weebson has just got a read on it right now. But, you know, I definitely feel it's becoming a big problem, though, because Weebson sometimes goes in a little bit too far. Luckily, able to escape, and Crisis is getting the worst RNG I've ever seen as they, they really have to play more reactively going up against Weebson. You can't play proactively, you can't play passively. You've just got to counter any time they walk out. Good job there by Crisis, covering a lot of Weebson's options there. The forward air, if that connects, that's likely to stock. And then quickly throwing out that forward tilt to cover the early air dodge from Weebson. So great option coverage there from Crisis. And the stall out too, seeing Weebson you know, threatening a lot of options and Crisis just says, okay, I'll, I'll wait. I've got the time to spend off stage. And although he's at 150, he is still even in stock count. Yeah, Crisis is, is having a lot of problems though. It is equally trying to do their hardest when getting back onto the stage. I think the problem just comes into the fact that Weebson, it's just as fast as Dirt Samus, but has more, uh, at least ranged moves, meaning that Crisis is getting hit more often than not, especially at that high charge. That just means you're spending your time off the stage. Now at this equal moment, it's for a comeback, and it's just really hard when Weebson is picking up this dark pit. Good quick string there from Weebson to get 37 onto Crisis. Crisis trying to find an answer here in neutral. Throwing out a couple of these Zares. I think he caught a Zare there actually, but Crisis is able to get back to stage once again. That neutral air knocking Crisis away. Down smash to cover a lot of the options, make it double, but can't find another. Down tilt comes through into the up air and Crisis up to 100%. It's getting hard. A well placed arrow midway off the stage will take it out. And Crisis really isn't knowing what to do uh, against them or when Weebson is on the edge. It's very much able to dodge out these electro shots, but with that counter, the stun gun isn't really doing anything. It's more of just a nuisance rather than an issue. It's just more of Crisis having to play that space, but not really having the range nor the capabilities to beat out Weebson. But Manji they just barely survive. And the forward smash whipped as well. So second chance at life once again for Crisis. And the armor of the side B coming through there for Weeps and seal away the final set there. And I actually like that mix up. I know that side B, it kind of feels like a cheat card, right? It's got all that armor on it and it's going to beat out just about every hit. But he hadn't used that side B all game. That's the first use of that side B we'd seen from him. And just when he needs it to ice this set. Uh, honestly, this is why Dark Pit is considered better than a normal Pit. Electroshock is just so good. And I mean, you, you know that Crisis just has to do something to make that space when they get back on. Or it was game over anyways it was a risk to play uh and it was one that they were doing continuously throughout the set so that's really good to read on to weebson and you know i think a really great moment to just show the versatility of of a character that has both long range and good mid uh kind of close range combat it is the one thing about weebson and this dark pit is that it feels like he can kind of play to any style uh, he can afford to play a little bit more adaptive slash uh, reactive, but there are times, there were openings, like you saw, Crisis just simply waits out the defensive options and punishes accordingly and found his few openings that he needed to. 
but in the end it was not enough as you see the flip kick i don't think he had his jump available or i think at least that was the plan in that moment but uh. either way falling a little bit short and this is a a much needed win for the side of canisius to really get themselves back on track with this win they get themselves one step closer to an even record and also like we mentioned that point differential they were minus 46 entering the split this is a 30 plus point victory for them they're practically back to even all around i mean that's just that's what you were gunning for that's what you got to be feeling proud of and you know if i'm them this is a pizza celebration where you know you got to do no homework or anything you just got to feel proud that you're coming back into that positive uh score line and for the other side niagara they fall to 0 and 9 but like we said there is a lot of you know building blocks here for this team just some stuff to iron out next week they get another mac uh contestant the manhattan jaspers so we'll see them there but we will be cutting to a short break to get an interview with one of the canisius players after this don't go anywhere
Hello everyone and welcome back to the EGF. We are here with MKL Rising and the rest of Canisius College after their victory over Niagara in the Battle of the Bridge. And uh, MKL, how are you guys feeling after this week's victory? Well, it was our first match of this season. So, and then we, I think we had a like really good start. Uh, I'm glad that I'm back to the team and like I think everybody here are having a good mood so like yeah and then we are like feeling so good for our victory like feeling amazing yeah in general yeah. well honestly first off love your mask by the way uh, but, <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah uh, but you know I I, I want to be honest with you guys you uh, you were dirty you, you were clean you were whatever word you want to say for good you guys landed some wicked smashes and honestly i want to get your perspective uh, of just like your mindset regarding those because i feel sometimes they're extremely risky to do so uh, when you're going for moments like those you know how how much are you like you pr prioritizing them well um i while i was out of the team like at least for me like i try to figure out uh new moves and like a expand new kill options and i think like these guys are doing the same thing uh we just want to like make sure if those will work and then like some of the moves are like su successfully like done it so yeah like it was like uh it was it's very like good way that we like successfully managed to like do some like amazing kills at, at least that's how i view it that's definitely understandable, and I mean, right now, this game was absolutely crucial. I, I would say crucial for you guys. You got to kind of benefit off of it, especially with that 30 win record. So uh, looking in, looking at the other teams that you're going to be going up against, what is kind of your hope for now? Well, our hopes are definitely, like, have a consistent victory. But at the same time, we probably, like, gave like expand our not like new options for our moves um definitely like know about uh the matches and since like in the can you just weren't really doing good last season like they we definitely want to like go <laughs> i don't know keep i don't know because i i'm confused i'm confused i don't know what to say sometimes like yeah we sh we definitely all right uh I just, I would just say we definitely want to have some good, consistent victories, yeah, for like next couple of matches, for sure. All right. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it's a, it is a pleasure to have you. I gotta ask, you know, what's it like, uh, you know, playing it in in a kind of room? You know, you've got a whole crowd around you here. What's it like playing in in that type of environment? Well, I definitely enjoy this environment because, like, when when player wins, everybody just, like, you know, cheers and, like, be super enthusiastic about it. And, like, I get even more motivated. So, like, yeah, I, it doesn't bother me. It actually, like, encourages me even more. All right. And uh, I guess I got... Well, uh, I got actually two more for you. Uh, uh, number one, you guys play Marist next week, and uh, Marist is one of these teams that's at the top of the the MAC conference, even though they lost this week. Uh, how? What is the preparation for that type of uh, match? Uh, what does the preparation look like? Well, definitely we're going going to like review their matches and like definitely know the characters they're going to use. Uh, and like try to like know how the match apps is going to be like um that i think it's like really good opponent to challenge obviously so uh but like yeah just we're gonna play uh very consistently and try to like win again yeah that's what i think at least yeah just win it's a good it's a good model just win uh, <laughs> yeah well definitely like i'm not i don't want to make it very obscure but definitely like try to know them and yeah. think yeah like try to figure out how to like play against them uh i like it all right 
Last yeah, question thanks. for you while you're here. Is there anyone you would like to thank or shout out while you have the mic? Uh, well, uh, if I can thank, uh, I'll just, you know, thank Niagara for having a great match. If I have to pick someone in this room, then, hmm. Are you well, scouting? Maybe, maybe one, just, but... <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, who, who should I think? They, like, they Ni all know Niagara, he's, like, he's got to be careful. <laughs> like okay thank you thank you everyone in this room who supported yeah. me <laughs> thank you everyone <laughs> <laughs> we we love to see it all right yeah. <laughs> all right thank you yeah. thank you mccall rising the rest of canisius uh, uh congrats on your victory this week and we'll see and we will thank see you. you next week yeah thank you bye <laughs> All right, and uh, and with that, we will. Uh, well, that is that is it for us actually here on the uh, on the EGF. We unfortunately don't have uh, a fourth match scheduled due to some uh, conflicts. But you know, it was an exciting day overall. If we could pull up that schedule one more time, we could recap it so that you know, it, just go over the results of the day. It was an interesting start to the to the split with that Mac battle. Uh, both here and at the at the end of the day. Uh, honestly, I agree, and I gotta say, each match in and of itself, I think, was a really good blast. We we got a lot of uh, clippable moments. I think, uh, more especially, it was a lot of learning for uh, both sides, knowing where they are now and where they uh, need to be. But I gotta say, at least my favorite was this match in itself. It was just so flashy. It really was. I mean. The, the numerous spikes, the the new technical things that we saw, you know, it, it's really fun to see, you know, even even just from last split to this split, to watch these players grow, it's it's really fun to watch. And uh, that's what we're hoping to see later down the line uh, for even teams like St. Peter's and Iona, who we unfortunately didn't get to see today. But that is it for us here at uh, EGF SSBU. We've got a full cast uh, on, the, on the docket for next week, but uh, you know, th this, is, uh, th this is it, I guess. So uh, to, to roll through things through, uh, thank you once again to EGF for having user and I uh, be able to cast these games. Thank you to House of 3000. Both Dylan and Dev have done a fantastic job of putting these, uh, you know, <laughs> broadcasts up for us it, it's, it's a blast working with them uh user any any last words for us this week at, at most i would definitely recommend checking out the twitter so you can stay up to date with all of the matches the broadcasts, and basically everything that is ggfc or if you really like our personalities our twitters are obviously down below you can check us out where we'll make sure to tweet out if we decide to cast smash again which we most definitely will because each of these collegiate teams manages to put on a show in itself but that's it for me and that is it for me as well so with that thank you all so much for watching egfc ssbu we will be back next week and we will see you there <laughs>